Good morning, everyone. My name is Rebecca George. I'm the provost at RPI. Um, thank you so much for joining us this morning and also for this very, very special reunion and homecoming weekend as we recognize and celebrate the bicentennial of RPI. On your screen, you will be seeing a QR code. We will be taking questions from the audience at the end of the State of the Institution Address. If you have a cell phone and you open end service, <laughs> and if you open your camera and point your camera at the QR code that will appear on the screen, it will open a, a link that will allow you to submit questions, and then we will take the questions at the end. The QR code will also appear at the end, <laughs> so you'll have another opportunity then. So great, let's get started. It's my honor to introduce the 19th president of RPI, Dr. Marty Schmidt, class of 1981. Prior to his arrival at RPI just over two years ago, uh, Dr. Schmidt served as provost at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Schmidt was also MIT's senior academic budget officer responsible for the Institute's educational programs as well as the recruitment of, promotion of, and tenure of faculty. Dr. Schmidt was, on, was a member of MIT's Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. And he served as the director of MIT's Microsystems Technology Laboratories. He is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineering. A seasoned researcher, inventor, entrepreneur, Dr. Schmidt holds more than 30 US patents and has played a part in starting seven companies. Dr. Schmidt earned his BS degree in electrical engineering from RPI, class of 1981. He earned his master's and his PhD at MIT, both in electrical engineering and computer science. It is truly my pleasure to welcome the 19th president of Rensselaer Polytech Institute and my boss, Dr. Marty Schmidt, class of 1981. Welcome. This is great. It's wonderful to see everybody. Um, and welcome to the 2024 State of the Institute Address. Um, what a phenomenal turnout we've had. Last year, 707 people registered to attend. And this year, we're nearly at 1,900. So just wonderful to see all these people here. And although I have to squint, I see a sea of red. So that's really awesome. Um, uh, and I hope you were able to enjoy the events yesterday. And, and in particular, I thought, uh, what an amazing drone show. That was fantastic. And I just want to say that there's a, been a team working on all of these events uh, for the reunion, but also for the bicentennial, furiously working hard on it. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful to them for all that they've done. So let's get started. So I've decided to call this address RPI Past, Present, and Future. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you some thoughts on RPI's last 200 years. I'll give you an update on what's been happening on campus and finally talk about our future. I'll make sure we end in time to respond to some questions and as Rebecca was explaining, we'll use that QR code just to be able to um, screen, uh, not screen, but to, to um, manage the volume of, <laughs> well, we might screen too. <laughs> Was that, what do they call that, a Freudian slip? Um, <laughs> so please use a QR code and uh, nothing nasty. Um, as far as our past, we've done a number of things this year and we'll be doing more to commemorate our first, our first five, 200 years. 
As we've been, collect, as we've been celebrating the bicentennial year, we've been highlighting a lot of extraordinary graduates. Of course, we all know about George Ferris, um, class of 1881. Two weeks ago, we had a Ferris wheel on campus, and we had a two-day festival for members of our community and for the Troy community. I'm told that over those two days, we estimate that 12,000 people came to the carnival, ate the food, ate from the food trucks, participated in carnival games, and rode the Ferris wheel. Indeed, Professor Chris Letchford, the department head in civil and environmental engineering, gave an interview on uh, local channel 10 and described what a unique invention the Ferris wheel actually is and how Ferris was inspired by the work by the water wheel at the Burton, Iron, Burton, Burton Ironworks in Troy. His innovation was to design it like a bicycle wheel with spokes in tension and the ring in compression to reduce weight when compared to a wagon wheel. Ferris's wheel debuted, debuted at, the ninth, at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair and it had a capacity to hold more than 2,000 people. Quite a remarkable structure. So clearly a lot of RPI engineering went into the design of that wheel. Since our students had such a great time at the carnival, we are thinking that we might make the carnival an annual fall event. But if we do, I'm told that we'll call it Ferris Wheeler's Day Off. I'm not sure who deserves a credit for that clever name. It's not me, but I, I learned of it from uh, May Lee, who works for uh, me. At our commencement in May, we awarded RPI's first, first ever posthumous honorary degree to Emily Warren Roebling, who took over the day-to-day -day management of the Brooklyn Bridge construction when her husband, Chief Engineer Washington Roebling, of the class of 1857, developed decompression sickness. During our commencement ceremonies, Emily Roebling was played by actor Liz Wisson, who also played her on the HBO series, The Gilded Age. In addition, Emily participated in a lively panel conversation with astronaut Reed Weissman, which was brilliantly led by our provost, Rebecca Doors. We were able to bring Emily to life through the work of Professor Jim Hendler, who is our Tetherless World Constellation Professor of Computer, Web, and Cognitive Science. Jim recruited his PhD student, Sol Ashira, and RPI's archivist, Jen Monger. Through expert prompt engineering, generative AI produced the panel script and the commencement address. And the script was fact-checked by a descendant of the Roblings, RPI's own Professor Antoinette Maniotti. So Emily's authentic diction was 19th century, thanks to a 21st century tool. If you Google RPI Bicentennial, you'll find videos of the commencement colloquy as well as other bicentennial events. And I encourage you to do that because it's a lot of fun to watch. And so while we're talking about the Brooklyn Bridge, another fun fact we learned this year was that the recent renovation of the bridge was done by a firm led by Tom Iavino, RPI class of 1973. And Tom is particularly proud that an RPI grad was able to restore such an iconic structure created by another RPI grad. But I have to say that my favorite memory for this bicentennial year will be something I learned that happened at RPI in 1948. Some of you no doubt know this, I did not. You know, one of the things that I really enjoy about this job is meeting alumni and learning about their life story and how it connects to RPI. <clears throat> I recently had the pleasure of getting to know Bill Coleman. He's a member of the class of 1949. He turned 100 years old in August. Think about it. Bill was born on RPI's 100th birthday, and birth year, and this summer he turned 100 on our 200th birth year. I was alerted to Bill's upcoming birthday and his amazing story by his granddaughter-in-law, Megan Potter, who works at RPI. RPI ties run deep around here. In the summer, Bill lives on Swan's Island off the coast of Maine in a house he built himself. Swan's Island is beautiful, but quite remote. 
To get there, Jen Brock, who's manager of President's Office, President's Office Operations and Board Relations, Jen and I had to take planes, cars, and ferries. But boy, was Jen and Marty's big adventure worth it. <laughs> Bill's story is incredible. And if you're a fan of the book or movie, Boys in the Boat, you'll see some similarities in what I'm about to share. So let me show you some highlights from the visit. So if we could bring up the PowerPoint. <laughs> okay, here we go. So Jen was in Troy and drove um, up to uh, Bar Harbor. I uh, happened to be in Boston at the time and flew uh, up to Bar Harbor. Lynn wanted to join me on this trip until she learned that the plane was a nine-passenger Cessna. <laughs> and the nine pas ninth passenger sits in the co-pilot seat. Um, we met in Bar Harbor Airport and then took the car down to Bass Harbor, boarded a ferry <laughs> for a 40-minute ride to Swans Island. Once we got there, we met Bill's family. Bill is wearing the blue uh, sweater there. Um, he is, in this picture, he's 100 years old plus one day. So we arrived the day after his birthday and his family was visiting with him to celebrate the birthday. We had a lovely time talking to Bill um, and then conducted an interview, which I'll share with you. Uh, we, of course, brought him RPI swag to commemorate. <laughs> commemorate his birthday. Uh, and here's a picture of Bill in his youth. Now, Bill grew up in Connecticut. He enrolled at RPI, but at the end of his freshman year, as World War II broke out, he enlisted in the Army, where he was trained to fly P-47 fighter planes. When he returned to RPI after the war in 1945, he helped the Institute launch a varsity lacrosse team. Even though, and this, this is something Bill told me, even though there were only four members of that team who'd ever played lacrosse before. <laughs> but they had the good sense to recruit Ned Harkness as their coach, the legendary coach who eventually led RPI's men's ice hockey to the NCAA title in 1954. By their third year as a team, in the spring in, of 1948, RPI's lacrosse team was ranked as the top program in the country in three years. Now that was fortuitous because the Olympics, which were to be held in London in the summer of 1948, had already decided to have lacrosse as an exhibition sport. And RPI, as the top program in the United States, was asked to represent the United States in a demonstration game against a British team. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The team had to find $20,000 and secure 875 pounds of non-perishable food, not only for their transatlantic journey on a troop carrier, but also for nourishment in a post-war England with limited food resources. In case you're wondering, adjusted for inflation, $20,000 today would be about $260,000. How could they raise that in such a short time in a post-war era? Well, it turns out RPI lacrosse home games on the 86th field were beloved by the residents of Troy. The team was drawing 4,000 fans to each home game that season. And between the team's fellow students and their neighbors in Troy, they were able to raise the funds, $10 donation at a time. At Wembley Stadium in London, in front of 60,000 fans, RPI took an early lead over the All England team. Then in the middle of the game, something happened. Let me show you some pictures from that year, and then I'm gonna let you, Bill tell you what happened. So this is the team. Uh, this is their, uh, during the regular season in 1948, they, they're sporting nifty cherry red uh, jerseys with the block letters and the white shoulders. This is a picture of Bill, he's the shorter gentleman, uh, talking to Ned Harkness. 
And they're wearing the uniforms they wore in the Olympics, which cleverly carries the RPI block letters and USA across the bottom. <laughs> Go red. <laughs> Here they are. Four trip ca troop carriers from World War II were used to transport all of the Olympic athletes from New York City to London. Um, they slept on bunks that were stacked six high. This is the game. Uh, RPI wearing their red jerseys, the British team wearing white. Um, and I asked Bill about that game. But the Olympic demonstration game was, as I understand it, played in Wembley Stadium. Uh, that's and, right. And was reported that 60,000 people were in attendance for that oh, game. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah. And uh, as I understand it, uh, RPI went out to an early lead against the British team. Um, uh, and, then, and then you had shared with me that in the middle of the game, everything went quiet. Yeah. Do you remember? Can you share with us yeah. why? All of a sudden, we looked around, and there's the king and queen up in the box, right up there in front of us. And Elizabeth, wow, the, the princess. And did they play uh, Hail to the King? Or <laughs> Yeah, they did. Wow. They did. So you got to perform in front of the king and queen of yeah. England. Now, the game ended in a tie, as I understand it. Right. OK. So you were? Barely. barely. Yeah, why don't you tell us about that last? Uh, 30 seconds or so. So the last 30 seconds of the game were very interesting. We're producing a video with the uh, materials that we got from Bill. When we post it, you can go find out what happened in those last 30 seconds. <laughs> it did end in a tie. Um, uh, and because it ended in a tie, RPI maintained their undefeated record for that season. Bill and his teammates helped lay the foundation for a f the future of lacrosse. And amazingly, it will become an official Olympic sport in 2028 at the Games in Los Angeles. Yeah. After graduation, Bill Coleman married his sweetheart from Russell Sage, Billy. And Billy and Bill were married for 71 years until she passed away three years ago. I think we can, let's see. Yeah, we'll do that. 10 years after he graduated from RPI, Bill started a business in New Hampshire based on a machine he'd invented. He was a mechanical engineering major. Um, the machine he invented that could weave glass fibers into fiberglass sheet. This was great timing, as New England boat builders were just moving from wood to fiberglass hulls. He grew that business and ultimately sold it when he retired. What's the message? RPI people tend to make great things happen because of their RPI education. And it's still true today. In a little while, I'll have a conversation with RJ Scaringe of the RPI class of, 20, of 2005, who is the founder and CEO of Rivian, which makes electric adventure vehicles and hopes to inspire all of us to leave fossil fuels behind. And I hope you'll stick around to, to listen to that. So let me now talk about the present. The RPI Board of Trustees Chair, my boss, is Dr. John Kelly, also an RPI grad. He and I have a regularly scheduled call where I brief him on what's happening on campus. I said to John early on that I believe that in our discussions, I need to ensure that bad news travels faster than good news. And in that spirit, in talking about the present state of RPI. I want to be direct with you, and so I'll start with some of our challenges. First, just this week, I announced the passing of one of our undergraduate students. Andrew Mann Hudspeth, a senior in mechanical engineering and an amazing and much loved leader on our campus. When you think about the potential, the future Bill Coleman's of today's campus, this is a gut punch. And I just want you to know that those close to Andrew are hurting. I will say, we have very robust support services. And I'm so impressed, so impressed with how our student life team responds to these challenges and supports our community. I think I would be remiss if I also didn't note that we lost Neil Barton this year. 
Neil, a longstanding trustee of RPI, served as acting president of RPI between April 1998 and July 1999. We celebrated Neil's life on Thursday with his family at the Chapel and Cultural Center. Turning to the campus, I want to also tell you that this year's rankings are just out, and we fell in both the Wall Street Journal and U.S. News and World Report ranking, whereas last year we went up in one and down in the other. We're in the midst of analyzing these. We do appreciate rankings are important in students' and parents' decisions on what school they wish to attend, and so we need to understand this and address it in a way, in a way that allows people to understand an authentic, accurate understanding of the value of an RPI education, which I think is phenomenal. Another thing I think I should highlight are the challenges that higher ed overall is facing. The loss of conviction that a four-year college degree is the path to prosperity. Serious concerns about the cost of higher education. The demographic cliff of the college-age population resulting in some small private colleges to close. And in the past year, concerns about the disruption and divisions on college campuses as a result of the conflict in the Middle East. These all represent serious headwinds, headwinds that we all face to varying degrees, although to some extent, STEM-centric institutions like RPI are less impacted by the concerns about return on investment. Most private schools this year fell short of their goal for enrollment, in some measure a result of problems with the federal government's financial aid system. RPI was not immune to this, and as a result, we have a smaller first year class here. I'll address some of these issues in a moment from a fiscal perspective, but let me first address what I would characterize as the elephant in the room. And this has come up over the course of this past year when some, some many of you have been incredibly polite, incredibly polite in carefully asking this question. What happened at RPI since October 7th, 2023? Have you had protests? Have you had encampments? Well, here's where I shift to the good news. <clears throat> and here is where I share with you the great appreciation I have developed for the RPI students and the RPI Student Union. Let me start with a funny story and then a serious story. In my first year at RPI, Lynn and I visited 18 cities to meet alumni. During our visit to Phoenix, I received an email from an RPI undergraduate who was very upset that the Mueller Center, our campus recreation facility, was not open early enough to allow him to exercise before his 8 a.m. class. He further went on to let me know that he had determined the reason for this was that RPI was unable to get staff to work those early hours. And he opined that I, as president, should simply increase the wages that we provide to our workers. As I always do when I receive a note like this from a student or a parent, I sent it to our then Vice President of Student Life, Dr. Peter Konworski, to ask his advice. And I went to bed. <laughs> Overnight, I received an email from Peter that informed me that there was nothing I could do. The hours of the Mueller Center and the compensation of the workers was a decision that required engagement with the Rensselaer Student Union. I have to tell you, I love the student union. The fact that the students can sort out where to prioritize investments uh, that support them, I think, is a, and, and do it in an engaged way with the administration, I think, is brilliant. And, and you know what? A few weeks later, the union decided to open the center earlier. The partnership that we enjoy with the students is phenomenal. And that brings me to October 7th. Early in the week, hold on, let me check something. Yeah, okay. Earlier, early in the week after October 7th, I received a number of emails from students that were offended by something that had happened in their classroom. We responded immediately, and the instructor for the class responded appropriately to the concerns. But I was worried, and I felt it was important that I send a message to the community. The message was short and simply stated that while I was not going to say you can't speak your mind on this issue, I ask that you consider that you might be speaking to someone that is deeply impacted by this, by this situation as you are and speak with empathy. 
For the most part, the message was well received, but I did receive a letter from the RPI Muslim Student Association. They were understandably unhappy with one aspect of my letter and requested that I send out another message to the community. Now, at this point, I had seen presidents at other universities send multiple letters, and none of them landed well. So I wrote back to the students and said that I didn't want to send another letter, but I wanted to meet with them to explain why. A few weeks later, we met with 30 students and their imam, who, as it turns out, was a class of 86 graduate of RPI. What I learned is that the Muslim community in the capital region has strong ties to RPI. The conversation we had that night went well, and they accepted my reasoning for not sending another letter. At the conclusion of the meeting, our then Associate Vice President for Student Life, Travis Apgar, asked the students if we could hold an interfaith vigil. The students agreed. And over the next few weeks, student representatives from the Muslim Student Association, Habat, Hillel, and several Christian organizations negotiated, negotiated over what prayers in their faith they would read at that vigil. I didn't know until the morning of the vigil if the students would converge, but they did. And that evening, we held an interfaith vigil for humanity and community in the armory, and our students read Jewish, Islamic, Christian, and Catholic prayers for peace in the Middle East. I was so proud of our students. But it gets even more interesting. The fall semester was quiet on campus. But in February, a group of students went before the Rensselaer Union Executive Board to have, Rensel have a new club entitled Rensselaer Voices for Palestine become a union-affiliated club. And this was approved by the e-board after a robust discussion. The students wanted this club to be dedicated to education, charity, and advocacy for Palestine, Palestinians. Over the course of the spring, they held several bake sales to raise funds for a Palestinian Children's Relief Fund. In April, however, a motion was made to put the club on probation for alleged violations of the Rensselaer Union guidelines and procedures, which state that there is no tolerance for hate mongering, violence, or discrimination. The concern was centered around some content on a Discord the board had a robust discussion with the club members and the person who raised the complaint. Some issues were clarified, and some troubling content was acknowledged. And the club said that it does not welcome any form of hatred or bigotry, but would take the opportunity to strengthen its policies against such postings. In the end, the union e-board voted 12 to 2 to not place the club on probation and the Rensselaer Voices for Palestine reiterated its vision for itself as an open forum for students of all opinions to participate in the discussion. I hesitated in sharing this with you because I can't guarantee that something won't happen in the future at RPI, but I think it's important for you to know what has or hasn't happened here. I think the way that RPI students have, mod have mediated conflicts and negotiated compromises offers a model for universities elsewhere. And it has reinforced a crucial sense of community on our campus. We truly are one Rensselaer. So with respect to other activities, our community continues to be recognized for their discoveries and innovations. Eight alumni and a trustee were elected to the National Academy of Engineering. And Sheldon Weinbaum received the National Science Medal at the White House, at a White House ceremony. Current students and faculty have made advancements in Alzheimer's treatment, printing hair follicles, improving circadian rhythm, and understanding the origins of the galaxy, among many other breakthroughs. And six graduate students have received National Science Foundation research fellowships. We continue to be aggressively pursuing all opportunities to garner support for CHIP's work and build partnerships with leading organizations in the chips industry, including a partnership with Hokkaido University, which is located in the prefecture in Japan where Japanese company Rapidus is rapidly building a state-of-the-art semiconductor plant. And of course, we are pushing hard to take advantage of our brand new IBM System One quantum computer 
And you'll hear more about that at the end of my remarks. Let me share with you a little bit about the university's finances. Last fiscal year, we did balance our operating budget. We are making investments in RPI by adding new faculty and staff to support the growth of research and by investing on more staff in advancement and alumni relations. We funded some of this last year out of prior year's operating reserves. We saw lower than budgeted tuition as a result of a smaller admitted class, but this was offset by expense reductions. Our debt was reduced by $25 million and now stands at approximately $604 million. While the numbers are not final, it looks like our endowment for FY24 will be slightly over $1 billion, representing an 11.9% return. And speaking of endowment, we did last year switch our endowment management firm. I want to thank the investment committee of RPI for their hard work on this, the vice president of finance and CF, chief, finance, chief finance officer, Eileen McLaughlin and her team, but particularly I want to thank RPI trustee, Jack Tai. Jack led this effort brilliantly to help us find uh, an excellent new investment advisor that investment advisor is Rock Creek, based in Washington, D.C., and we were impressed with their experience, expertise, connections, and data-driven analytical investment approach. I'm very excited about this move. I think it's a great move for RPI. Let me now talk about our future. This fall, we will release our strategic plan. It will contain a concrete five-year plan entitled Rensselaer Forward, along with a more visionary document titled RPI's Future, Our 10-Year Aspirations. Our 10-year plan reimagines RPI in the face of larger trends, including the higher cost of education, declining public faith in the value of college, and a demographic cliff that I mentioned earlier, with a declining national population of high school graduates. At the same time, we are keenly aware that the world needs talent in science and technology is only growing as is the pervasiveness of advanced technologies such as AI. I believe at the core of my being that by 2034, RPI will be widely seen as a premier science and engineering university recognized for its robust learning community, integrating creativity with science and technology in service of society's greatest challenges. This journey will include leading a reignition of the capital region and achieving a sustainable financial model that sets a strong foundation for RPI's future. We'll do that by becoming a premier arts and creativity-driven science and engineering university in the country. We will build a welcoming, creative, and energetic learning community focused on the discovery of new knowledge, processes, and products. And finally, we will lead a renewal and integration with the capital region in part so a large percentage of our brilliant students find opportunities right here after graduation. To realize all of our goals, we are increasing the ultimate goal of the billion dollar transformative campaign launched by Dr. Jackson. We will raise it to the goal to $1.5 billion, of which we have already secured 750 million. This campaign is so important for making RPI a more financially resilient institution that is less dependent on undergraduate tuition with an endowment that allows us to seize opportunities as they arise. We'll formally relaunch the campaign at the end of our bicentennial year. My mission is to get our alumni fully engaged with RPI, proud of RPI, and supporting RPI so that in our next 200 years, we can continue to have a transformative impact, just as Stephen Van Rensselaer envisioned. But we can only realize that goal through sustained and substantial participation of our alumni. It has been the privilege of a lifetime for me to lead RPI for just two years. <clears throat> I thank all of you for returning to help us celebrate, and I hope you will offer us your advice on putting this great institution on the right path for the next 200 years. In a moment, I'll entertain questions, but now I need to change costumes. I actually won't do it, but I want to share with you this, because in April, I was formally uh, adopted as an honorary member of the RPI Quantum Computing Club. <laughs> I 
and I want to, at this point, invite two of the co-presidents of the RPI Quantum Computing Club to come up to the stage for a presentation of something they've been doing. So Nick Grabaleski, Grabalevsky, I butchered your last name, Nick, come on up. And Queenie Sun, please come up. And you can uh, introduce your Rock Creek colleague. Uh, hi, so uh, I'm Nick. I'm a co-president of the Quantum Computing Club. I'm a senior in computer science. Oh, hi. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm a co-president of the Quantum Computing Club. I'm a senior in computer science. And uh, in a minute here, we'll present the quantum finance project that we worked on. But first, I want to introduce Huai Zhang. He's the person who did this project with us uh, over at Rock Creek. I'm Wai Zhang. I'm a manager director uh, in Rock Creek. As the president mentioned, we are the investment advisor for RPI endowment. Can we get the slides up from, from the laptop? There we go. OK. So uh, as you can see on the screen, so we, we, we are proud to be the OCL advisor for the RPI. We are an investment uh, firm. We have about 90 people, including PhDs in, from multiple STEM principles. And uh, we, we are really focused on quantitative researches. We have our in-house technology for, uh, platform and AI models to analyze global market and the investment opportunities across multiple asset class. However, even with our power, we actually have a problem to do a lot of quantitative models. That's simply because of the limitation of the traditional computer. The computational complexity of some quantitative models is actually beyond the reach of the traditional computer. And when I participated in the quantum computer ceremony, and I'm thinking, wow, this must be the solution to our problem. So I met uh, Quinny and Nick, and uh, we team up to explore the quantum computer modeling for a finance problem. And uh, Quinny and Nick will show you what we did. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was really great working with Rock Creek on this project. So our project simulates a portfolio's performance using quantum computing. So uh, if you take three stocks that, have, that are interrelated and you take their historical data over the last 20 years, you want to be able to simulate you know, their performance over the next 10, 20 years. And so this seems like an easy enough problem to, uh, to solve. But when you have 100 stocks, and the classical computer, it actually becomes very computationally expensive. And so this is where we try and use quantum computing to actually solve this problem. And in our example, we have, uh, we use three stocks. And uh, as you can see the graph here, that is actually the results when we run on the quantum computer. And so uh, it looks like a normal distribution, which is about what we'd expect in our example. And uh, this, this project really shows that you know, there's a lot of potential for quantum computing. This is just one one-month project, and there's a lot more to do. Thank you, Nick. Hello, my name is Queenie, and I'm also a co-president of the Quantum Computing Club. I would first like to start off by saying that none of this would have been possible without the generous donation of Mr. Curtis Preen. Let's give him a quick round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. We were able to do as much as we did because we got results back within minutes from the priority access of the RPI quantum computer. As you can see on the slide, we have a screenshot of the RPI quantum computer's job queue and the screenshot of a public quantum computer's job queue, meaning like anyone can send jobs to the public computer. 
At any given moment, you can see that there are 700 jobs in the public quantum computer and zero jobs at the RPI computer. This means that testing that took us up to a couple of minutes to get back would take a day or so to get back on any other public computer. In our case, we ran the code 130 times on the RPI computer over the span of a couple weeks. If we were to do this on a public computer, it could take half a year. We did this project using Qiskit, which is IBM's quantum computing library in Python. A subset of Qiskit is Qiskit Finance, which contains a few quantum finance specific functions. As you can see here on the right, the entire library has only 13 functions. And in our project, we were able to write five new quantum related functions. Hopefully this gives you an idea of just how little research there is in quantum finance right now. This creates a beautiful opportunity for us and other quantum interested RPI students to really make our mark on this industry. We're also publishing a paper on our work, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask us in the Q&A. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh. <laughs> I, I just want to uh, cover a few things with the, while they're here. First of all, uh, lest you think there are six-year PhD students, <laughs> what year are you? A senior. A senior in computer science. Computer science, Nick. A senior in computer science. Okay, so you have two seniors with uh, pursuing their bachelor's degree. We're able to do this work. The number of algorithms they uploaded represents, I think, 40% of what's now in that library. How long did it take you to write all these algorithms? This problem, yeah. A month. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you can overwhelm it in another month. Um, the other thing we talked about was, you know, b even before we announced that we would have a quantum computer, you guys had formed the Quantum Computing Club. So I hope you were happy when you got the announcement. Um, <laughs> How many people were in the club when you formed it before you know, uh, the quantum computer arrived? Anything? Probably like three. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you were maybe up to 100 or so when, uh, when we did the ribbon cutting back in yep. April. Mm -hmm. uh, how many are in the club now? 400. <laughs> That's better. How many are freshmen? Half, 200. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked them this to poll the group and ask how many of those 200 new freshmen that arrived, you know, less than a month ago maybe, uh, how many of them uh, made the decision to come to RPI in part because of the existence of the quantum computer? It was 75%. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> So, so Queenie, and Nick, Queenie and Nick will stay seated so that if you have quantum questions that you post with the QR code, and maybe we could put the QR code back up, um, they'll be here to answer it. All right, let me end. What I'm trying to do this weekend is deputize nearly 1,900 alumni that are here today to tell this story, to tell your friends that this is RPI's moment. This is Troy's moment, this is the capital region's moment. We can do this. This is why Lynn and I are here. We need your help. We need your support. We need you to spread the word. This is the moment. This is our moment. We together can propel RPI into the future. I am blessed, blessed to be the president of this amazing institution. And this may be the most consequential period of our future. I ask you to help. You are here because you are committed. Let's get our fellow alumni engaged. I love this institution just as you do. I want our fellow alumni to dust off those frustrations about dining halls or their dorm room or how hard the place was <laughs> or how we might not have properly recognized them in the past because we were spread so thin financially. Let's go forward together. Let's go forward. <clears throat> I'm all in, Lynn's all in. The board is all in, the faculty, staff, the students are all in. This is why we need our alumni to be all in. I know you are. So let's do this, let's do this together. We have a gem. RPI is a gem. And I believe together we can make that gem shine. Thank you for being here.
Get a little energized. Okay, Matt, what do we got? All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Tremolin, Vice President for Institute Advancement. Thank you for submitting your questions. Uh, we did get some questions in advance and then using the QR code, so appreciate that very much. And just a quick update. With the walk-in registrations we had yesterday, we're over 2,000. So record setting. <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's just it's great to see everyone here. So thank you very much. So Marty, you touched on the first question. Um, you touched on in two different points. It's a question that we get a lot at our alumni events. So what is the status of the student union <laughs> and the independence? Uh, yeah, you know, this comes up a lot. I'll, I'll be brief. Um, the substance, I, I know there's concern about it, and, and I spent a year trying to figure it out. Um, one substantive change was that the budget for varsity athletics, the part of the budget for the varsity athletics, which was coming from the student union fee, that part was moved over to the authority of the director of athletics, who's now Christy um, Powers. Um, Aside from that, I don't believe there's been any material change in how the union is run in its history. And to test that, I think it was last year or two years ago, last year, I got um, about five former presidents of the union and grand marshals uh, to, to join a WebEx with, uh, as well as with the former director of the uh, uh, union whose name escapes me, Rick, I think. Thank you, Rick Hart. <laughs> so they all participated. We brought two past GMs and PUs to the WebEx, or the current one and the most recent past one. And I asked them, talk to them, ask them how they run the union. Uh, the conclusion at the end of that conversation was to these uh, former GMs and PUs that nothing had changed. So, and I think you also saw that in the lesson I shared today, which is that the students are really phenomenal and are doing an amazing job with the union. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next uh, point here that I thought uh, I highlighted, and thank you for entering this, is uh, a little uh, background. So Ferris Wheeler's day off is from the 93 GM week. It was a mashup of RPI's first African-American GM, Bill Wheeler, his last name, and that we had a Ferris wheel. And I'm told that Bill is here. Bill? Excellent, all right. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful to see. So we're gonna have to have John Kolb add that to his traditions uh, presentation. So thank you and, and welcome. Um, Marty, uh, questions, uh, if you could comment on the various college rankings. <laughs> <laughs> Settle in. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, what I would say is that um, one of the things that's happening is a lot of the rankings are trying to pivot to outcomes. So, you know, what's the relevance of, you know, the SAT score of the incoming class when, um, you know, you want to wonder what's, what's going to happen, what are they going to benefit from from their education? And a lot of that is being done with big data and analytics. and. Um, and when they started that, RPI actually in one ranking last year went up a fair bit um, based on, uh, largely based on the, um, the employability, if you will, of our graduates. So that's good news. This year, um, <laughs> two things happened. One is in, uh, in the Wall Street Journal ranking, uh, ranking, which we dropped quite precipitously, they included a pulse survey of students. So between, between January and May, they sent out a pulse survey and asked students to express their views on, on the university. Now, I don't know how they were able to determine whether or not someone that was filling out the poll was truly a student from that institution. I also am willing to bet that at some universities that had realized this was happening, probably pumped up their students to say, hey, when you get that survey, or go get that survey and do something great with it. So that. <laughs> we'll be doing that in January. Um, <laughs> but, but more seriously, what I would say is, 
I, I think if you just focus on rankings, and, and this has happened, people watch the rankings, if they drop, and they drop because some, some different variable is being used, they, they run towards that. They sort of change how they operate to affect the rankings. I think that's like driving by looking in the rearview mirror. And what I think we have to do as an institution is define what's important to us about this institution. Is it important to us how quickly students graduate? Is it important to us how many of our students are, a, are able to be employed um, at the end of their time here? Is it important to us that an education at RPI is a path to prosperity? And how would we measure it? I can tell you one ranking that came out two years ago does the following, which is they look at um, the top graduate programs in disciplines. So what are the top graduate schools, say, in engineering? Then they look at the PhD students in those programs and ask, where did they come from? Where did they get their bachelor's degree? In that ranking for engineering, RPI is the sixth highest in the nation. For Sixth highest in placing our bachelor's degree students in the top engineering programs in the country. So I say that because I think if we can not be whipsawed by rankings that are, frankly, US News and World Perks doesn't do the journal anymore, they just do the rankings. That's their revenue source. And creating churn in a ranking is, a good, is good business. Um, but if we can use big data analytics decide what's important to us and tell people, if you come here and you're interested in going on to a great graduate program, this is a great place to be. And, and what are some of the other things that we can describe the Institute about and compare ourselves to other institutions? That was longer than you wanted, <laughs> but uh, that's where we're at. Thank you very much. So uh, more, we've got probably. some wonderful faculty talks coming up, so we've got time for one more question. Um, any plans on research collaboration with other institutions? Um, yeah, so we, we, opened a, a, we opened a facility in Manhattan. Uh, my first year here, it was something that Dr. Jackson spearheaded. And so we have a great collaboration with Mount Sinai in New York City, uh, and we'll be doing more of that. A lot of the things we're doing in the chip space are collaboratively, both with industries, but with other academic partners. Um, this Nordtech effort that we won last year or two years ago involves, I think, six other universities, and we're collaborating with them. We're also honestly looking for ways in which we can increase our collaboration with neighbors, whether that's the University of Albany or Hudson Valley Community College. Shekhar Gardi is sitting here, our Dean of Engineering. We've developed some great pipeline programs with Hudson Valley Community College. Um, really trying to respond to the workforce development demands of, this, of the semiconductor industry. When you think about Micron, uh, the memory manufacturer headquartered in Boise, Idaho, they made a $100 billion commitment to expand their manufacturing in upstate New York. That $100 billion commitment, when it's fully realized, is going to be 9,000 jobs. So Micron, over the next decade, is going to be looking to hire 9,000 people that are knowledgeable about semiconductors. We can't do it on our own, but if we can, if we can partner with Hudson Valley Community College, partner with others, um, I think we can do something big. And our competitive advantage in that space is the fact that while most universities stopped doing research in mainstream semiconductors as that industry went offshore, there's a, there's a cluster of semiconductor activity in New York State because of IBM, because of Global Foundries. And we have 34 year old, or 34 industry veterans for 30 or 40 years with PhDs that, um, that are coming to our campus to help us teach. And that's a competitive advantage. So the short answer is, yes, we're looking for those collaborations where there's mutual value add in, in the relationship. I can see the hooks coming. Um, so <laughs> I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm sorry to kind of push on you to say, let's get our alumni going, but I need your help. And, uh, and, and what wonderful students uh, we have here. So Queenie and Nick, thanks for being here.